in history and in tradition. Europe is a continent of kings and castles and a continent of war. But long ago, in the shadow of ancient monarchies, a democracy was born. Today, it still lives and flourishes. And its people, secure behind the granite ramparts of the Alps, have not heard the sound of battle in more than a hundred years. Our story is of these people and this place, this land they cherish and preserve, this mountain land, this lovely land, this Switzerland. Glacier and crevasse, crag and chasm. This is the alpine scene. Here nature carves out her strange geometry with a matchless hand. This frosty pyramid is the Matterhorn, 15,000 feet of living granite. And over all the wild profusion of rocky spurs and frozen spires, Nature set the peak of Monte Rosa, highest of all, and gave it a plume of cloud mist. These are the mountains of Switzerland, and they spread across three-fifths of all the land. The valleys and lowlands, though smaller in area, are equal in beauty. Soft green meadows, winding streams, and quiet lakes, like this, the blue lucerne. The cities of Switzerland are like paintings in a picture book. This is Lucerne. And this is Geneva, old in tradition but new in spirit, modern and progressive, a cultural center, and a city famous for watchmaking. From the jetty that marks the entrance to Geneva's harbor, a silvery column rises 300 feet into the air. It's called the Fountain of Living Waters. Zurich, largest of the Swiss cities, will always retain its old world charm. For by law, every new building here must conform with the classic architecture of the past. The towns of Switzerland are quaint and quiet. This is Stein am Rhein. And here a moment's pause to observe a chimney sweep at work. And then to watch a wedding procession. of small candies is not a bribe to get rid of the children. It's an inducement for them to stay, for their presence is considered a good omen, the promise of a fruitful marriage. Farther along the way, the chimney sweep crosses their path, and this is considered a sign of extra good luck.
Under an old but still active Swiss law, the young couple must appear at the local marriage bureau for a civil ceremony, even though they've already been married in the church. But now all the rules and regulations have been observed, and the bride and groom begin their honeymoon. Of course, in Switzerland, the sea of matrimony is oftentimes a mountain lake. In Switzerland, four major languages are spoken and a great diversity of dialects. And yet the Swiss people are all bound together by two indestructible bonds, their belief in democracy, their love for their mountain. And so the true story of the Swiss lies here on these rocky slopes, among these towering crags. Here is a mountain village. And now for this little while, let it be all the villages of Switzerland. Its population, 170, and the principal occupation, hard work. There are few modern conveniences here. On wash day, the village fountain becomes the village laundry. But even on the busiest morning, one can always find a little time to tend the garden. The village blacksmith occupies a position of first importance. In his humble shop, he forges the future of the whole village. The economy here depends on horsepower, the real thing. And it's up to the smith to keep it operating on all fours. Apprentice to the blacksmith is his little son. But how will he ever learn his trade if the customers keep interfering? Swiss youngsters have few idle hours, and the village goat boy has no time for play at all. Early each morning, it's his job to collect all the goats in the village and drive them out to pasture. The young herdsman is elected to his post, and for his labors receives a small wage and a free lunch supplied by a different family each day. For the most part, the goats are well behaved and the drive proceeds in good order. Except, of course, for that one wayward kid who just won't go along with the crowd. The boy and his dog together make an efficient team. In response to whistled commands, the dog carries out his end of the job to perfection. Nimble as the goats are, he's always one jump ahead and his control of the flock is amazing. The Swiss have mastered the art of vertical farming. They divide the mountainside into three distinct levels. The lower meadows are used for the growing of grain, the middle pastures for grazing the cows. And highest of all, on the rocky slopes, the goats find a sparse but sufficient fare. When the grazing ground has been reached, the goat boy counts noses and discovers that someone's missing. And so a search begins.
times like this, the goat boy will risk any hazard. He's responsible for every member of his flock, and to lose one of his charges would be unthinkable. In the Alps, sometimes the only way down is up, and then down again. And so in the end, boy gets goat, goat gets lunch. Farmland is so valuable, no one would think of building a house on it. Instead, the farmers live in the villages and drive out to their fields each day. This is horse and plow country. In fact, on these rock-strewn hillsides, modern farm machinery would hardly be practical. It's during the spring planting season that every now and again a strange and lovely music echoes through the high valleys. This is the music of the Alp horn, an instrument as old as Switzerland itself. The Swiss are lovers of tradition, and these cowbells will soon play their part in one of the oldest and oddest of spring pageants. It's filled with all the music and ceremony so dear to the hearts of the villagers. this pleasant accompaniment, a parade begins, a parade of cows. For charming as this spectacle is, it celebrates nothing more exciting than taking the village herd to pasture, their summer pasture, high on the mountain meadows. pageant has a most unusual finale. It always ends in a fight, and of all things, among the ladies. Actually, this is an elimination contest to decide the leader of the herd. aren't exactly good losers, and while they're grumbling about their bad luck, 
a coronation takes place. On the sidelines, the runner-up registers complete disdain. But from now on, she and all the herd will pay homage to Her Majesty, the Queen of the Mountain Meadow. All through the summer months, the cows will remain in these upland pastures. Close by, the official cheesemaker and his helpers set up shop. Elected to his post and paid by the villagers, he will stay here for as long as his job requires. The amount of milk given by each cow is measured from day to day. Its owner will receive cheese and butter in direct proportion. In the cheese making process, after the cream has been removed, the milk is combined with a curdling agent and heated in these vats. Now, after a proper interval, the curds are being removed. Here, the cheese is pressed into wooden molds. This cheese, by the way, is not the ventilated type commonly known as Swiss cheese. Dated and labeled, the cheeses are stored on these shelves to be divided at the end of the season among the villagers. With the coming of late summer, haymaking begins. And this will be the winter food for all the village livestock. After their livestock has been provided for, the farmers prepare for their own winter needs. And again at harvest time, the whole family joins in the gathering of the grain. Threshing is done with primitive implements called flagels. To their rhythmic beat is added the squeal of wooden cogs and the rattle of ratchets. Then the soft whisper of the grain. A quaint and colorful medley, the song of a Swiss mill. a good crop this year, and even after leaving a generous portion to pay for the miller's services, each family will have plenty of flour for the snowbound months that lie ahead. After the harvest, the harvest festival, a time for music and merrymaking.
When nature dresses the village in winter white, the pattern of life appears to move at a slower tempo. And yet in every home, there's a feeling of excitement as preparations begin for the Christmas season. There are no department stores, no toy shops in the village. Gifts must be made at home by hand. And the children have a remarkable talent for a wide variety of arts and crafts. And a normal talent for mischief, too. In the kitchen, there's a spicy fragrance in the air. And so heavy are the demands made on the ancient stove, the staff of life must share its honored place in the oven with the cookie sheet. Of course, the young helpers must sample every batch. Christmas comes at last and it's given a traditional greeting. Silent Night, sung in Romanish, oldest of the Swiss languages. During the Christmas season, in every village and town, it's feast or festival. Here's a group preparing to celebrate a sort of Swiss Halloween. Some dress as ghosts and evil spirits. But the most popular masquerade is an elaborate headpiece, which usually depicts some familiar village scene. Here, the cows are driven to pasture. Below are views of the cheesemaker's hut. On the back, a design made from the insignia of the local trade guilds. Another hat shows a logging scene. Everyone's ready now, and so the merrymakers set out to annoy the neighbors with the Swiss version of Trick or Treat. called the Schlitteda. The fancy trappings and gay costumes are actually museum pieces. But once each year, they're given an airing as the young people pay honor to the old time ways and go for a sleigh ride. pace in the nearby resorts. Here, in contrast to the quaint customs of the villagers, Switzerland treats its winter visitors to a more modern form of recreation. The Swiss are expert skiers, skilled in the slalom and the schuss. The youngsters, of course, excel in the sitz mark.
It's a common belief that skiing is an age-old sport in Switzerland. Actually, it's quite recent, imported from Norway about 50 years ago. To reach many of the Swiss resorts, trains are the only means of transport. This is a special ski train. Of all sports, skiing is one of the most exciting, the most exhilarating. spills, however, there's nothing to equal bobsledding. And these Swiss runs are among the most famous in the world. It's teamwork that counts on the four-man sled. There's one to steer, one to break, and two to bob. But on the one-man sled, you're on your own, and that's the biggest thrill of all. There are no brakes, and to steer, you drag your feet. Famous among the Swiss festivals is the Carnival at Basel. It's called the Fasnacht and dates back to the 14th century. In the parade, every guild, business, and profession is represented. The theme is good-natured ridicule. for instance, is an effort to prove that there really is a Swiss Navy. These leaflets, called schnitzelbanks, are printed with satirical jokes and poems. Pageants and Swiss parades are only passing things, but the mountains of Switzerland are eternal. 
And it's fitting that the Swiss people who find protection behind these granite summits and rest their livelihood from these rocky slopes should also find their recreation here. And so they've made the strenuous sport of mountain climbing a national pastime. These young people are scaling the Matterhorn, the fabulous peak that stands as the symbol of their chosen sport. from the summit, 15,000 feet in the air, the climbers can look out across their mountains into five different countries, Spain, Italy, Austria, France, and Germany. These then were the people of our story, hardy, happy, industrious, a people at peace with themselves, at peace with the world. And this was the place of our story their beloved homeland, this mountain land, this Switzerland.